Thank you, Josh. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the second and final day of the Hunger Free Community Summit. Yesterday was wonderful and a wonderful start to the event with amazing speakers, informative panels, workshops, and we expect more of that today. Once again, I'd like to express our gratitude to General Mills, Share Our Strength, Feeding America, Islamic Relief USA, Bread for the World, Congressional Hunger Center, and Ecovia Solutions for sponsoring the summit. Now I'd like to introduce a video from Senator Debbie Stabenow. While she couldn't join us live, she was gracious enough to send a video. U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow made history in 2000 when she became the first woman from Michigan elected to the United States Senate. She's a ranking member of the Senate Agriculture Committee where she is a true champion in the fight against hunger. She's a senior member of the Senate Finance Committee, Energy Committee, and Budget Committee. Josh, can we play the video? Yes, we can, just a second. Hi to everyone taking part in the Alliance to End Hunger's Hunger Free Communities Summit. Thanks to all of you as participating organizations and activists for everything you do every single day to help families get food on the table. As we know, the pandemic has worsened the problem of hunger in America. We're not just facing a public health crisis. We're not just facing a financial crisis. We're also facing a very real hunger crisis and it's growing. That's why I've been very focused on providing more assistance for families through the COVID-19 crisis, and I know you have as well. I'm glad we were able to extend pandemic EBT through next September and to cover children who attend daycare. This important program allows families with children who receive school meals to purchase additional food in the grocery store. We were also able to extend school meal flexibilities through September 2021. That will let schools and nonprofits serve children during closures and provide multiple meals through in-person distribution or delivery, so important. Now, Congress needs to pass my Bipartisan Food Supply Protection Act to help fill a number of the gaps in the food supply chain. This bill, as you know, helps increase capacity and address growing demands at food banks and strengthens food partnerships to prevent food that could feed families from being wasted. Of course, one of the most important additional steps that we can take right now and we should is to boost SNAP. That is long overdue. The updated HEROES Act, which was passed by the House and has been waiting, waiting, waiting in the United States Senate, would boost SNAP benefits by 15%. That would provide an additional $25 per month per person, less than a dollar a day. And you know an additional dollar might sound like it's not very much, but it makes a big difference for families and our economy. We have a lot of work to do a lot of work to do to address hunger in America. And as we continue to fight this pandemic, you can count on me to be your partner as we work to stop hunger in our country. We need you. Be engaged, push hard on behalf of all the families and the children and the seniors of our country. Thanks for all you do. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you so much. We so much appreciate Senator Stabenow's leadership, um, particularly on nutrition issues and her support of our agenda to boost SNAP. And as you heard, it is absolutely critical. And we're actually asking you to take a few minutes today to call or tweet or write your member of Congress and let them know that families need relief now and they need a boost to their SNAP benefits. Um, so we really appreciate her words on that. Uh, now I have the pleasure to introduce Tony Hall. 
Uh, for those of you who maybe didn't uh, hear his introduction yesterday, I'll let you know. Uh, Tony is a national treasure and we are lucky to have him as the Executive Director Emeritus of the Alliance to End Hunger. Um, before he was at the Alliance, he was, at, he was a U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Agencies for Food and Agriculture between 2020 and 2005. And prior to that, he was a member of Congress representing the third district of Ohio in the U.S. Congress for almost 24 years. If you haven't already seen Tony's inspirational TEDx talk, please do so. Tony, I'm handing it over to you. Thanks, Minerva. You're wonderful. And uh, it's so wonderful to work with you uh, over the years and, and uh, Danielle and Nate and, and Eric, what a wonderful team and all the people that you've put together. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Of course, I remember a friend once saying, I'm so happy to be here, but at my age, I'm happy to be any place. Thank you. I also want to thank all the people that helped you, Minerva, put this together and organize this summit. And I want to thank all the participants for joining us today. And while the term may be overused by now, many of you really are frontline workers. Uh, you, you fight hunger in, in these uncertain times. And um, I'm kind of joining you today wearing two hats. One as the executive director emeritus of the Alliance to End Hunger, but uh, I also have a hunger-free community in my old and my hometown of Dayton, Ohio, and uh, I'm the sponsor and leader of a hunger-free community there. So as I was preparing for these remarks, I was struck by the goal of the summit, which is to understand the changing landscape of hunger and build a resilient post pandemic America. The truth of the matter is, is that the pandemic is helping us get a better understanding of hunger. It, it shines a light on our moral failings when it comes to caring for society's most vulnerable. Hunger is a community issue. It's a justice issue. And yes, it's also a political issue. When I founded, uh, my initiative in Dayton, Ohio in 2015, my hometown of Dayton, Ohio was already struggling. We uh, were following years of uh, uh, an industrial decline. We had lost uh, 10 automobile factories. We were in a great recession. Uh, Dayton at the time uh, topped the list of the hungriest cities in America. I think we were the fifth hungriest city uh, in the country in the year 2015. In West Dayton, many of our friends and neighbors received personal and devastating lessons on what, what it means to live in a food desert. Uh, I have the largest food desert east of the Mississippi. They were unable to access nutritious food for themselves or their families. And we knew that we had to act. Five years later, we are closing in on opening a co-op called the Gem City Market. And this market is gonna be owned by the community, for the community, will provide fresh and nutritious food to West Dayton. But we also know that to truly feed a community, we need to approach hunger holistically. On top of selling food, the market will provide cooking and nutrition classes, and community meeting space, a little bank, a coffee shop, <clears throat> excuse me, to build social ties. Uh, uh, there will be yoga uh, uh, lessons going on, all kinds of things. Of course, when we started building Gem City Market, we did not predict the pandemic. And while we pushed to get the market open, we witnessed COVID-19 devastating lives around us. And we all know by now that the current health and economic crisis disproportionately impact communities of color. People of color hold many of what we have now come to call frontline jobs, the jobs that cannot be done from the safety of home. 
And further, we know that many of these individuals who live in food deserts, they suffer from poor health and it's caused by lack of access to nutritious food. And suddenly in the midst of this pandemic, we are learning that diseases and conditions caused by poor nutrition, it, it can lead to very serious and even deadly outcomes among those who contract COVID-19. This pandemic underscores the interconnected nature of all the things that impact hunger in America, health, nutrition, justice, policy, community, and cooperation. And this is what I like so much about the hunger-free community model. I know that a lot of our organizations have simply been, well, we've been overwhelmed by this crisis. But I also think that the hunger-free communities provide a good framework for how we build a resilient post-pandemic America that can truly become free from hunger. Just look at the summit sessions from yesterday and those that are happening today. The sheer breadth of topics and expertise delivered by participants in the summit is staggering. Sessions on equity, messaging, data, coalition building, policy, technology, tailoring responses to disenfranchised communities, and so much more. This summit highlights why it is so important to bring diverse voices together to respond to the complicated issue of hunger. And I think this is what hunger free communities is all about. I'm no stranger to the frustrations of getting elected officials to respond to the issues of hunger. I've been in 17 elections. And as a United States Congressman, I've learned that hunger is among the very few issues that can have such an immediate and devastating impact on families yet can avoid urgent actions within the Congress. Even today, with our community urging Congress to raise SNAP in response to the health and economic crisis, an issue that many of us would call a no-brainer, we are seeing resistance. But the power of advocacy that hunger-free communities can provide can be a game changer. At the Alliance to End Hunger, we we have seen how incredible your advocacy efforts can be when mobilized behind a single policy or issue. And local community organizations and networks, they can grab the attention of elected officials in a way that national organizations cannot. We need to bring the issue of hunger home for these officials. Make sure that they see it and understand that it's not something that simply happens somewhere else to somewhere somewhere else to, to someone else. You know, your vote is really important and you know more than anybody else knows about the issue of hunger. And there are people that, that just went through election that were elected by the skin of their teeth. There's one thing that scares political people, voters. And you need to ask these politicians, these elected officials to come see your work in the hunger-free communities and tell them about what's going on. They want your vote. You have something to say. And most importantly, you have power, you have clout, you have votes. It's a stressful time for many of us, but I am also very hopeful. I believe that the energy and passion and commitment that I see at this summit is saving and will save lives and livelihoods in the short run. But I also believe once this crisis is over, that our collective work holds the answer to ending hunger in America. Once again, thank you for your dedication and your leadership. It's wonderful to associate with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tony. We appreciate you so much for all the work you do when you were in Congress, now at the Alliance, uh, but also in Dayton and playing such an important leadership role in the anti-hunger movement there. Uh, thank you again, Tony.
Now I'd like to introduce our, our keynote speaker, Graham Christensen. We know food security is inextricably tied to food production and agriculture. So it is my, my deep pleasure to introduce Graham, a farmer from Omaha, Nebraska. As part of the Nebraska Farmers Union, he helped with climate change and renewable energy education efforts and worked on agricultural and energy policy at both the state and federal level. Currently, he is the founder and president of GC Resolve, a communications and consulting company that focuses on grassroots community de development, mobilization and education with an emphasis on environment and the creation of more resilient communities. And today for us, he's going to address building resilient communities from the soil up. Graham, over to you. Thank you, Minerva. Tony, thank you for those comments. Special thank you to US Senator Debbie Stabenow for providing the video and the vision around nutrition. In the back room, Josh, all the hard work you do that goes unnoticed, we all notice it. It's a pleasure to be with Alliance to End Hunger today at this convening. The Alliance to End Hunger is playing an enormous role in the conversation around nutrition. The Alliance to End Hunger moving forward is gonna to continue to be vital as we look at how we can update our food system to deal with the issues we're dealing with today. Just a quick background, and then I wanna dive right into things so we can use this, this time as preciously, this precious time in as constructively as possible. Uh, my background, um, I'm from Oakland, Nebraska. It's Northeast Nebraska, one hour north of the Omaha metro area. We're 153 year family farm tradition. We homesteaded in 1867. Uh, where our farm is transitioning into a more biodiverse with the goal of being a regenerative operation in a few years. We're somewhere in the middle of that right now. I have a journalism background, which goes into a lot of the communications work that we do at GC Resolve. I am on the board of directors and state secretary of the Nebraska Farmers Union. And along with GC Resolve, also do some work around the installation of alternative energy projects around the region. More recently, uh, we have myself and many others have co-founded Regenerate Nebraska, which is a network that is looking into the future and pulling the conversation of food production quickly into the future with a new vision. It's a simple vision. Some of this comes from knowledge that we've gleaned from the past generations, knowledge, knowledge that we've gleaned before any of us may have been here. That's called indigenous knowledge. Um, but we're bringing that to the mainstream of conversation in Nebraska because we feel that this is the only way that we would be able to move forward. Diving right into things. One of the most exciting projects that we're working on currently is around the pandemic and it's called Pandemic Research for the People or the acronym is PREP. This PREP division has a rural focus and we've been working together with a large nationwide coalition to dissect some of the deficiencies we're seeing in the food system that have come to light in front of more of the general public during, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Furthermore, we're looking at how we can transition into a regenerative community, into a regenerative food system that really benefits and takes into mind all people from all places, no matter who you are or where you are at. The first piece that we introduced was around national security. The second piece was just reduced or was just introduced earlier this week. And it's around what happens when we neglect our nutrition. I'm gonna spend some time talking about those two pieces uh, now, but also just want to give a teaser. We will be also um, putting out a dispatch white paper as well on plantation economics and historical discrimination within the USDA, and also starting to peel away the huge issue we have that is up and coming. We're already we're already there, but it's going to intensify as we move in the future. And that is what to do with all the land as it's concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. If we do not get young, diverse people back on the land at this time, if this is not a federal focus, we're in big trouble. 
the baby boomer generation has the majority of the land right now and they will be transitioning it. But we have to have young people back on the land rather than multinational corporations. And you're gonna see in just a bit um, what's happening in Nebraska and why that part is becoming more crucial by the day. On the national security piece, we took a synopsis or a snapshot of what's going on in, in Nebraska. And as you would expect, we have a lot of meatpacking plants. These have become hot spots for COVID and the neglect that has been put onto the workers, these essential workers during this time, well, we could have a whole nother session on the stories that, that we catch both first and second hand um, here on the ground. But because our food system is creating a national security threat and we've seen it arise even more clearly in COVID, we're asking for a few things and it starts with increasing meat, meat packer worker protections, pay and safety standards. These people have been de deemed essential. They have been coming back to work, but there's not enough focus on their health and safety. This has to be a national priority. Without these people, the food doesn't get to the table and then we have even more serious issues. The second piece that we have to focus on in the upcoming administration, and we thought we had a chance in the last administration as the Department of Justice and Eric Holder, as well as the USDA started investigating antitrust issues is just that, antitrust legislation. There has to be access to the marketplace. There has to be transparency in the marketplace. We don't have these things right now. And so a big part of this is consumer awareness, consumer education and driving the demand. We have to have a louder voice from the consumer side of things. But as farmers, we have to be freed up to be able to play in, in, in these markets and be able to differentiate our good products. Third, that has been coming up over and over again is state inspection of meat processing and reciprocity so we can be able to ship over borders so we can increase local and regional access. This is local and regional economic development. We produce more foods locally. That means we have a more secure food supply. But as COVID hit, the small guys were pushed back and some of them still from the first wave of COVID uh, earlier in the year, now are not being able to process because we don't have enough small processing plants until 2021. And then many, much of the holdback was when the big companies had to slow, stop, or spread out, they dumped a bunch of their product in the small plants. What does that mean? Our small farmers who are, are barely getting by but doing everything the way they should be doing go out of business with another year of disturbance. And so this is a serious security threat. If we do not want to have food shortages under disruptions like COVID, or even looking at what is possible to happen this winter, we have to be able to start looking at how we spread out those, those plants. And that also is the spread out portion of that is also a good way to be able to cut off outbreaks in these more centralized locations that harbor a lot of people working close together. It slows down the lines, which is certainly more ethical. And it also cre creates more business opportunities in rural America that we have lost and we need to have them back. And of course, farm subsidy reform, this will come up again, but we have to start investing in highly nutritious food products and we have to invest in the young people back on the land or it's game over. We need to, at the state level, start looking at resuscitating those old state level corporate farming bans that protected independent operations from the influx of multinational systems, putting farmers on contract and lowering the wages for the workers at this time. We should not neglect the thought and a process and a policy piece that has worked so well over the years in rural America and rural Nebraska, bring this back. And, and in order to secure the food supply, as well as the farmer safety net, it was this group, this coalition talked about reenacting the grain reserve. The latest piece that we put out by Prep Rural is, co is called Neglecting Nutrition, How a Pandemic Has Exposed Health Disparities in the Rural U.S. And what this piece, basically this, this coalition of Prep Rural, which by the way, Alliance 10 Hunger was a contributor on this. Thank you to Megan Loveless for helping us get a bunch of the nutritional pieces in place. Special shout out 
Um, but this group, first of all, looked at the disparities in rural and found out that rural Americans are more likely already to die from chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer, chronic, lower respiratory disease, and stroke. In the United States, the trend towards obesity has culminated into 70% of our population being overweight or obese, and 60% of those obese being malnourished. Approximately half of US adults have at least one chronic condition and 25% have two or more. The correlation is also connecting to this to the rise in ultra processed foods. According to the US Census data, 25% of Native Americans, 21% of, of Black Americans, and 18% of Hispanic Americans live in poverty. This poverty piece puts these folks at risk for more chronic disease. All of this makes many of us, a high percentage of us more susceptible to predatory diseases like, or viruses like COVID-19. And that may explain in part why black Amer Americans are dying from COVID-19 at a rate 3.7 times higher than whites and why indigenous populations follow closely behind at 3.5 times more frequently dying from this virus than whites. In Washington, DC, astoundingly enough, black residents accounted for 45% of COVID-19 cases and a staggering 79% of the deaths. You get the point, I can go on on this, but we have to focus on the solutions. In order to fix these problems, to fix our national security, to fix this nutrition crisis, we have to have a larger structural change. And in order to do that, healthcare must be accessible to all. It's gotta start focusing on good health, nutrition and illness prevention. We have to get ahead of the game instead of instead of spending so much investment in pharmaceuticals that are only a Band-Aid at the end of term. We also need to put the farmer in the role to be a part of the nutrition solution. If we do not get this right in the future, we will continue to see these patterns increase and these, these correlations increase and we'll continue to have an unhealthy nation. As residents and citizens of this country, it is up to us to make sure that we care for everybody, that everybody has an equal opportunity at good health. But we have to start by focusing on making sure people have the resources they need to be able to do that. Uh, another thing that came up, our educational curriculum, K through 12 and at the college level, but obviously things can get more focused, but K through 12 needs to teach the fundamentals of soil health and nutrition to our young people. We have to get that back ingrained in the mind. It was shocking to me in Nebraska when I asked who was behind writing curriculum and it was a cattleman's organization and uh, I can't, it was either Cargill or ConAgra. We have to have alternatives that further dive into the nutritional aspects. Our young people are our future and they have to be able to understand how to access good nutrition. We have to get away from the continued influx of confinement systems that are that are also degrading our water systems as well as the health of the soil and depleting the nutrition through these ultra processed products and feed. But we can't leave our farmers behind. We have to help them be able to be a part of the solution in a risk adverse sense. It's the only way that this will work. And this goes further into being able to help transition the young people onto the land as, as there will be a need for more smallholder landowners in the future in order to meet these goals, most certainly. And then the local and regional market systems have to be opened up and we need to see community control. So we have these circular economies, which protects us all. It puts us all in a much more resilient situation moving forward. The vision under the, the going out Secretary of Agriculture, the outgoing Secretary of Agriculture is in America, the bigger, the big get bigger and the small go out. I don't think in America, Sonny Perdue said, that we for any small business will have a guaranteed income or guaranteed profitability. Folks, that's not acceptable. This will not work if we wanna have a food system that is just, just that is healthy, that is nutrition, nutritious and is accessible. We need more small business to, businesses to be a part of the solution, including the farms, including the packing, including the distribution. This is the only way that we can get proper care for the land 
to create more biodiverse regions that, by the way, also reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the same time as restoring and regenerating the soil and producing the most nutritious, nutritious product available to the masses. On the other hand, this is what's happening now. Big companies are coming into our area, are coming into Iowa and across the Midwest regions where both federally and in the state, we have diminished our protections in statute. We have no way to stop this, but this is deteriorating our water systems and this is expediting all the problems that we've already talked about and this is not accessible. What's happening is we're finding all these red hot spots that are high nitrates in, in this case, in this, in this um, uh, chart that you're seeing here that highlights where everything is that's over the EPA legal limits for safe drinking water. We also now are testing pathogens and what we're finding since the litter from the poultry product, from the, from the poultry operations that I just showed you in that previous slide, we know where the litter goes. We tested before to get a baseline. We tested after and poultry related pathogens like salmonella are on the increase uh, very quickly. Um, it's a pretty drastic increase uh, that we, this is not sustainable. And so we have, to, we have to be able to have programs in place now that let us do the monitoring. And so the Watchful Citizen Program, which was just introduced yesterday in the state of Nebraska, calls on citizen volunteers to be able to help watch these confinement systems and make sure that they're abiding by the, the few, the few um, regulations that they do have in place and also not skimping on the health of those that live around. So we're taking this into our own hands and we have to. And of course, the Public Health Association is urging a moratorium on CAFOs. Um, and so, and we're asking for new standards um, in rural counties to update um, what has become a, a very intensified issue here in, in the last few years. But we have the solution, it lies in the soil, it depends on how we treat the soil. And so Regenerate Nebraska and this new vision um, is, is, has, been, has been inclusive of 86 groups that put this together. Um, we are looking at a bigger picture with a bigger group and this is happening all over the country. Look at what biodiverse operations look like. This farm has been organic since 1950s, yet this is 220 bushel corn. My friend Anthony couldn't believe it. On the other side of the state, we're seeing more biodiverse operations that, that raise more, more plant proteins, more peas, more lentils, uh, more beans, more of those kind of things. Stephen Tucker is, is one of the folks in the Southwest part of the state that's leading the way. We're looking at new models on how we can be able to produce poultry. We're, this is actually happening right now in, in Minnesota. For those of you who have heard of Ray Hinaldo Hazlitt Mariquin and the Regenerative Ag Alliance, uh, this, is, this is his engineering, this is his creation. And you're seeing how we're building nutrition, but once again, it starts from the soil up. And just imagine if more operations are looking biodiverse like this, the amount of sequestration uh, that can happen from the greenhouse gas emissions. Just imagine how much more nutritious the end product will be. And it's not just about the meat protein, of course. Plant-based diet is important. We're learning to get rid of more of the processed products, be more cognizant to have that balance. I've had to do this myself being a Nebraska farm kid. Um, hazelnuts and elderberries are very common off of the operations that I just showed you. And of course, everyone needs to, there's a place for everyone in regeneration and it happens in the urban areas too. All these vacated lots in North Omaha, in Detroit, in Chicago, in St. Louis, or anywhere else across the United States of America can be part of the solution. We need to be able to enable more people to get involved with growing their own nutrition and of course, having that accessibility, um, what will also help connect the consumer and the farmer as US Senator Stabenow was talking about, and this is also highlighted in the neglecting nutrition piece, is more focus on making sure SNAP is funded properly and that it is accessible uh, for everyone that may be in need of that at the time. That will only create more market opportunities for the farmers and, and improve this food desert issue that we're seeing in some of the areas that I just mentioned. Now is a time that we have an amazing ability to reshift the conversation. Now is a time with COVID as 
bad as it has been, the more of us are cognizant, the more of us are trying to seek better and more healthy alternatives. But now is the time that we must do this for ourselves and our families. But not only that, we must take our voice and bring it to the policy platform so that we can enable this to happen for more of us so we can have a more resilient and more healthy country as well as community to live in moving forward. I appreciate your guys' mission, keep it up. We're all in this one together and it's gonna take all of us in a more unified approach than it's been in the past. And one more thing before I take questions, let's make sure we get a secretary of agriculture that understands this. Thank you, Graham, that was amazing. There are so many kudos in the chat. Uh, people really appreciate the message. Uh, I have one question right now and I will ask people to drop your questions in the Q&A uh, so that we can make sure we get those answered for you. Um, but really appreciate your, your thoughtful presentation, Graham, and, and how all of this is holistically connected. Um, there is a question, which is um, someone is thanking you for thinking about hunger as a, a problem within the larger food system. And the question is, do you work with the local chapter or, or larger organizations like the Farm Bureau or IFSA Extension? Uh, wondering how we can leverage existing partners to bring the voices of small farmers, especially in urban areas. First of all, the answer is yes. Um, in Nebraska, for instance, uh, we got a bunch of young folks that are part of the extension and are starting to do some really cool things. And um, this is exciting and it's a little new edge. Um, I, you know, I think this is being energized by a bunch of people that want to get things right moving forward. Um, see the writing on the wall that there really isn't an opportunity, you know, for a farmer moving forward under the current system, um, unless you can be, you know, one of the last ones standing. Uh, I'm very encouraged by that. Uh, as far as the, uh, and, and I should also mention that we have relationships um, we work with the Med Center, the University of Nebraska Med Center. We've worked with the University of Nebraska Lincoln Department of Civil Engineering. And we've also had, um, uh, we've also had a lot of back and forth going with the um, uh, Doherty Water for Food um, out of the University of Nebraska Lincoln and um, the Agronomy Department too, and, and Horticulture, Agronomy and Horticulture Department. Um, as far as the Farm Bureau goes, Yes, of course, we, we want to work with the Farm Bureau. There's so many great members within the Farm Bureau, but I am not sure that the way that their structure works, the top to bottom approach, allows the Farm Bureau members to get active in a, in a more proactive way. Um, we've been trying this for 100 years now, and it's not a clean process. And so I think, you know, my sense is that you work with the good people on the ground in this case, which a lot of times is able to have really positive consequences, but I'm still a little bit leery about the mission that it, from the top that's driving what the organization is doing at the end of the day. And we're gonna have to be better than that. We don't have any more time for these games. Thank you, Graham. Um, there is another question around engaging youth and, and getting youth uh, to, to really look at careers in farming. I should mention National FFA, Future Farmers of America, is a member of the Alliance as well. So we know the great work that they do. But what, um, what's your analysis of why that's such an issue and what can we do about it? Well, you know, I, we highlighted that we need to have a, a larger focus on educational curriculum that gets the science, the soil health, and helps like have a larger focus on nutrition. And, you know, in reviewing the curriculum options in Nebraska, yeah, some of this stuff is in there, but I don't think it has the, the um, kind of profile that it needs for our young people to be equipped to be in a position to help make sure that they're not dealing with the 70% you know, uh, obesity factor that is currently going on in the United States. So um, everything is about our young people. Partnerships with the FFA chapters, um, with 4-H, uh, you know, with any youth group, um, with science classes in schools, uh, you know, we, we have to prioritize that no matter what, what we do. Um, our young people are our future. Um, they are definitely on the clock right now. So all institutional knowledge, we have to be able to 
do our best to be able to pass that down. And as we're developing programming moving forward, we need to be able to always, always prioritize getting young people involved. Um, this is our future. They are a part and they also sense the, the issues that they're up against. Um, my sense in working with a lot of young people is that they wanna be a part of the solution. And so we need to be able to equip them with the tools. Um, I'm 41 years old now and I look at my role is that I may never see, you know, I may never see that the end in where this is all set up and working as harmoniously as it should. Um, but I know that I have an ability from my experiences and what I've seen and the knowledge that I've accumulated to be able to at least open these doors, to pass on this information, to help put people in places where then they one, one day can take the torch and be able to stand on the shoulders of whoever came before them so that they can succeed and see that end positive vision. This is, this is the right thing to do. And so um, we always accept opportunities to collaborate with young people and we prioritize that in any way we can. And even in the citizen scientist program, that water testing program with the nitrates that I showed you all that data, we had large participation with high schools across the region that were starting to learn how to do the testing and what that means, um, what excess nutrients mean. So everything we do focuses on young people. And I just think we all need to block off a focus on that right now because we are the bridge, but they are the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have one final question for you uh, from the audience. If you could pick a secretary of agriculture, who would it be? Well, um, there's a lot of action in that conversation going on and everything changes by the hour. But um, I would tend to probably want to put three candidates um, in the forefront of the conversation. Um, one of them is getting the most publicity right now, and that would be Congresswoman Fudge from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I would support, support Fudge. Um, Fudge, with her experience on the Agriculture Committee, is vital. Her, her uh, track record on nutrition is extremely important. Once again, we, us farmers can't carry this the whole way. It is the urban population centers, the consumers, um, you know, that have to become a more part of that. I think she can help in power that I also understand and know that she is a pretty dang good organizer and uh, carries uh, the leadership kind of skills that are needed. But to be fair to her and to be fair to the farmers as myself out there, we also need some practical um, experience in the farming world around her, maybe some of that antitrust experience. And um, so we need to surround her with a good team so that we can make this happen. Um, other folks that I would toss up, you know, in there that, that could help uh, bring her, you know, up to that that complete level would be Dave Domina out of Omaha, who is a a, a wild card name, but this guy is amazing. Um, Dave Domina is is an attorney, and what he has done is not only stand up for the environment on issues such as Keystone XL, but he's an antitrust leader, and you can find his keynote uh, back when they were doing the Department of Justice USDA investigations on market concentration on antitrust. Uh, he's also not been afraid to stand up for the little guy, like a bunch of cattlemen that I knew scattered across rural areas that have some challenges when big companies um, uh, utilize the price fixing techniques that we hear about from time to time. Uh, he's, he's taken on many other big companies and all you have to do is go to his website and understand that he's a, he's a person of the people. He understands the, the, the soil health based solution and nutrition as well. And that's the kind of experience level, you know, we're going to need at the top and then um, John Boyd Jr. is another one of my favorites. Uh, he's got a track record too of standing up for people. He brings that practical farming experience. Um, if not, if not Secretary of Ag, he I believe he had a part in creating a civil rights uh, uh, branch there. That um, I can't think of anybody that could be better than him. And so those are my three top names that I would put out there. Um, some things are going to fall into place, but wh whatever it is, I think all those three need to be a part of the team, um, no matter what. Thank you so much, Graham. And thank you for being with us today. It's been incredibly thought provoking and we look forward to continuing the conversation. It was my pleasure. All right. So Graham, if you could stop sharing your screen. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so, 
that was really wonderful and very informative. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, so for the rest of the day, we have three plenary sessions, our lived experience advisory board, the Hunger Free Communities Network, uh, are going to be talking about how they've been impacted by COVID and what they've done. Uh, we also have nine breakout sessions on really engaging topics, and uh, we hope you'll check those out. And we will wrap up today with the highly anticipated panel with the new leadership from Bread, Frat, Feeding America, and our own Eric Mitchell at the Alliance to End Hunger. And please don't forget to check out our pre recorded bonus session material. Uh, and you can find that in yesterday's agenda, including a workshop from the SDG2 Advocacy Hub based in Australia on the Chef's Manifesto. And at one o'clock, uh, please join uh, the plenary Engaging Community Beyond Storytelling. Um, Heidi, any final words uh, for how folks might transition their way around the day? This is Josh. I uh, would like to say thanks to all of our speakers for sharing their experiences with us today. Um, I would encourage all of our attendees to continue the questions and conversation in Whova. Uh, you can access that at any time by clicking view session from your agenda. So coming up next again at one o'clock is a panel sharing how to engage community beyond storytelling. Click on agenda in Whova and select the panel title or session details button to be connected. Thanks a lot, everybody, and have a great rest of the day.